Good morning. Thank you to everybody that's wearing a name tag. It was kind of funny this morning because I, I have missed, I think, four of the last five Sundays. I spent two in Africa, one at Summit, uh, one recovering from surgery. And I saw some folks come in, and I didn't really recognize them, and I'm thrilled you're here. But I saw them glancing at my name tag, and I said, I've been gone too long. Uh, but my name's Bud, and I'm proud of the staff here at the church. It's so good uh, to be back. I want to thank you for your prayers for the African team as we traveled and journey. Uh, we spent a long time traveling last weekend, and we're excited to, uh, to be back home. And uh, just want to, uh, for our church family, want to give you uh, just uh, some news that I think most of you know, but in case some has not heard this, uh, yesterday morning at about quarter to seven, Carolyn Ratcliffe, made her journey to be with Jesus, and uh, we rejoice with the family and the legacy left. Uh, we sorrow for their loss personally, and, uh, but I want to say to you that, that Carolyn was ready to go home. She had said, uh, I'm, it's my time, and, and we're excited uh, to uh, just visit with the family. I'm going to mention that as I go into my message because there's some things that happened there that certainly... Uh, apply to our message. We're continuing our series on Deliver Us From Evil, and uh, our message this morning is on vigilance. And uh, just uh, want to say how excited I was to hear about the great altar response last week, as Pastor Rick shared, and, and as uh, uh, the week before, while I, I was in Africa and Rick was in the hospital, uh, Jason stepped to the plate on forgiveness and heard great re, uh, responses from that. And so I uh, thank the Lord for it. Uh, but this morning we're going to focus on another aspect of this whole idea of how you and I deal with the world we're in today. If you're here and this is your first time, thank you so much for being here. And we hope that you feel at home and you feel safe and you're able to open your hearts and your minds and allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your life because God, this, uh, how great you are, this God we sang about, that's not just words we lip, that's actually what we have discovered that our God is the God that is a great God of deliverance and strength and encouragement, and we hope you will find that here. So now we want to talk about this thing of vigilance. And the reality is, if you are a person of faith, you are going to go through experiences in your life where you actually feel a tremendous sense that you are overwhelmed. It's bigger than you are. And Paul wrote something in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9 that I want us to read together. It says, but we have this treasure, in other words, our faith in Christ, in jars of clay. In other words, in these human physical bodies that get tired and weary. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. That's not bad news, that is good news. Because there are times when we rise to face the day and we say, I don't have whatever it takes to get through this day. But he does, Amen. And he wants to supply our needs, so it, it, it belongs to God. We have this treasure in our, in our clay jars. Then verse 8, we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair. Now, you start reading that and say, I got a little depressed. The reality is this. Life is difficult. And there are many of you that are here this morning, and you're carrying burdens that maybe no one else knows about. But that's not easy. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote that to the church at Corinth. If Paul was experiencing that, we know that all of us experience big bites of that sometimes and little parts of that sometimes. But the reality is everybody that hears my voice here in this room this morning, you have gone through or are going through those times when you feel pressed, you feel attacked, you feel cast down. Everybody within a, an hour's radius of this church, every one of them, go through those times of perplexion and despair. Jesus is the difference maker. We live in a world, and everybody in this world, we are created with a, with a need for God. 
We are created with the inability to do life on our own and do it well. We need faith in him. And so I want to begin to talk to you about that and the need for vigilance. And we uh, talked a few weeks ago, actually the last message that I preached, which was on David, and talked about how David had, had uh, Saul of an, as an enemy, but it really wasn't Saul that was David's enemy. It was Satan himself, the devil. And we hear a lot about God, too little about Satan sometimes, but he is a real character in the human story. And he's, the, the, actually the definition of the word Satan is adversary. And he's our adversary. One thing we need to know about Satan is this. Satan has already met a crushing defeat. And there's a passage in Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 13, I'm, or verse 15 rather. I'm going to read it in the New King James Version because I love, uh, it talks about how when Christ died on the cross, what took place. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public, spect public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. And that's talking about the, the cross and about Christ. And when it uses the term principalities, that word, when you find it in the Greek translations, it means overwhelming power. Jesus Christ, when he came, faced an overwhelming enemy, so it would appear an enemy that had consistent defeated mankind in all of his efforts and Jesus Christ crushed everything that Satan stood for at the cross and he bought freedom for you and I freedom to live out our lives in a way that is pleasing to God uh, freedom to know that we through him are more than conquerors and I love that that idea that Satan is a defeated foe but he still has a tremendous amount of power an influence in, in our world, and we need to understand it. He's active and powerful, but his destiny has been decided. And we read that in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. And this is at the end times when God finally uh, brings everything to an end and he establishes a, a, a new order. It said, And the devil who had deceived them, speaking of the world, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So Satan is defeated. His goal way back, and we're not going to take time to discuss it all, was to take God's place. And he was cast from, because uh, Satan began as an angel, he was cast from his role. And since that time, has done everything to defeat everything that's God or good. But no longer does he have an agenda to achieve the throne. He knows that will never take place. He has one single goal, and that's to take as many people to hell with him as he can. And the Bible says we have two choices, heaven or hell. And it says and that Satan is out to destroy us and our families. If you're here as a mom or a dad, not only is it critical for you to understand your own spiritual journey, but your spiritual journey profoundly affects all of those under your influence. And whether you're a parent or whether you have friends and relationships and coworkers that you care deeply for, who you are in your spiritual journey is critically important to what happens in the lives of many. I looked up this, uh, this word vigilance, the definition of it. It said the action or the state of being careful, watching for danger or difficulties. We're called to that, to an awareness, uh, uh, you know, a diligence, uh, a, a, a level of keen discernment so that we understand what's going on around us. And the reason for that is found in a scripture, and we're going to pop that one up in uh, uh, Second Peter, or First Peter, rather, chapter 5, verse 8. I read this verse when I was discussing the story of David and, and Goliath. And it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. I had a new appreciation for what that means because when I was on this trip to Africa, we had an afternoon we went on a safari. And uh, I had, and we were, it's an open safari. There were like 12 in, the, in, in this car I was in. And we had live wild lions two feet from us. We weren't in a cage. It was an open setting. And I had a new appreciation for what a roaring lion might look like. <laughs> Pardon this English, but those suckers are big. I mean, uh, uh, there were two female lions, and they were impressive. And, you know, and just the way they moved, you knew they were in charge. 
And that was, you know, and, and they were close, and we were pretty quiet. We weren't scared because the dude in front, who's done this many times, wasn't afraid. Now, why those lions weren't checking us out, I am not sure. Because I thought, and I thought then, well, they feed them so they're not hungry. I found out later they do their own hunting. And I thought, I'm not as fast as a gazelle. I'm probably a pretty good choice. <laughs> but, I, you know, I was doing it. And then all of a sudden I look, this is my picture, and the big boy shows up. And I just took a guess. I, you know, I've been a, I'm a hunter. And I said, that animal has to weigh 500 pounds. I found out that a large male lion weighs 550 pounds on average. So that's probably about where he weighed in. When he walked on through... It was, there was something about that that was pretty awesome and a little bit scary. And I, I, but I was in the middle of the wagon and looked around and I thought, well, if he gets, if he gets hungry, he'll probably get full before he gets to me because there's four <laughs> or five in front. But then I looked again and I said, they're all pretty skinny and I'm pretty meaty. <laughs> I really wasn't that. I was actually more nervous when a uh, couple, what a big old bull elephant. Uh, pushed us back down the road. He come marching up. Those things are huge. But it gave me a new appreciation. And to be honest with you, if I were wandering through that bush where they do their hunting and I saw that lion, it would be a tremendous reason to be afraid. The reality is we, we need to be afraid of Satan's power. It's like a roaring lion. He has destructive ability. And it calls us to this thing called vigilance. And I want to look at what the Scripture says in 2 Peter. And we're going to read it in a minute. But I want to read a verse with you about this vigilance, and it begins within. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, which is another synonym for, uh, for vigilance. For out of it spring the issues of life. What goes on here leaks out over everything. And it either is a blessing or it is a curse. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Second Peter chapter uh, 1. I'm going to read a few verses beginning at verse 3. It says, His God's divine power has granted to, to us all things that pertain to life and holiness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence by which he granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. The Bible says we're corrupt. We're born in sin. We're shaped in iniquity. We need to escape that. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he afforded us an opportunity to know him as our personal Savior, to know a glorious, perfect Savior. That provided for you and I an opportunity or an avenue for escape. And there's two or three things in here that I want you to note. It says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's in verse 3. God has provided for you, every man, every woman, every teenager, every child, to live a life that is free of the bondage of sin, a life that is free of the, of, of the change of bitterness and immorality and all kinds of things that like to hang themselves off us. We can do that, it says, through the knowledge of him, when we begin to understand him. And then it goes on in verse 4 and says, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. And what are those promises? that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature. You and I can actually be like Jesus. You can know the thing you ought to do and then do it. Some of you might be here and you say, but I've been struggling with stuff for years and years and years, and I've never been able to break it. Jesus Christ can break it. Amen? You can live above the stuff that wrecks your life. And, it, and I was thinking about this, and I was very, I was just passionate in my office because I realized 
that we have a society now in which so many people do not understand what that means. So what you and I need to do is to come to know Christ and know him within us. Most, you know, most everybody here this morning, hopefully there's some of you that don't, and we're so glad you're here. But most of us know quite a bit about God, at least. But you can know all, all of the things in the world about God, and I won't do you a bit again. You need to know him in a relationship. You need to know him intimately. Like, you know me, you know Irene, and some of you know us quite well, but I really know Irene. And Irene really knows me because we have an intimate relationship. And that's what Jesus Christ wants with us. And, and that's what he desires for us to have. And there's a reason why he desires that uh, to happen in our lives because it fits in with this idea of vigilance. Be partakers of the divine nature. Literally, God wants you and I to partner with him and understand and taste the sweetness of his nature. And I've watched that happen in people's lives. I, I, think, of, 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 uh, I, I think of one individual that... Uh, I had the privilege of leading to Christ, and I remember how dark she was. Not she just there was a darkness about her. Uh, there was a there there was a hardness. And she was just a very bitter person, very gossipy, very angry. And I remember the night that she re received Jesus. She and her husband. Just like that, this golden smile, this glow, this heart for Jesus. It was, it was powerful, and it was transformational. And, I, and uh, it was interesting because someone just recently came up to me and, and mentioned her name and said, it said, say hello to Bud if you see him. And they had, they had uh, met her and... Uh, all these years later, that, that, I think I led her to the Lord in, in 1982 or 1981, one of those times. Either, I think it was the spring of 1982. God is a life-changing God. He knows how to transform us. And that verse 4 says, escape the corruption that is in the world because of the sinful desire. We live in a world that's living passionately, but it's living passionately in some very bad directions. And so God, God is calling us to something different. He's calling you to a virtue and an experience with him which you know and understand how to escape the bondage that our world is in. Paul talked about it in Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4. You know, look at that and then we're going to dive into this just for a few minutes. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? In other words, God wants to kill sin. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as, Jesus, as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And that literally is what God is calling us to. And that's literally what many of you that are here this morning hunger for. A newness of life. I was privileged to go up in a home where I saw spiritual vigilance. And I had parents and I had grandparents who were fastidious about their walk with God. Not legalists, but deeply sincere in their walk in it. And as I was thinking about that, and this thing of vigilance and, and this message, and I had another text that I was going to use, but this one jumped out at me, and I said, this is where I want to go. And we're going to look at verses 5 through 7 over the next uh, 15 minutes or so. And I hope something gets triggered in your heart about your spiritual journey. Let's look at verses 5, 6, and 7. He talked in verse 4 about the fact that we've escaped the corruption of this world because of its sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. 
and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. And verse 8 actually says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you think of this idea that we are to be vigilant, vigilance only occurs in one way, as you and I grow in Christ. You cannot afford to be a stagnant, made a decision, and that's it. And he uses a very interesting uh, phrase here. And by the way, vigilance is not, some people think of vigilance, think, well, vigilance is when things get really rough, I hang in with Jesus. No, vigilance is preparing for the time when things get rough so that we are in great standing with Jesus. You don't prepare for the battle in the middle of the battle. You prepare for the battle ahead of time. And if you haven't prepared, many times the battle will take you out. But he makes this interesting statement or a phrase, uses very phrase, says, every effort to supplement your faith. Your salvation experience is not enough. It isn't. You need to grow in your relationship with God. That's what he intends. It, it, our spiritual experience is organic, organic. And we need to grow in that relationship with him. And so let's see what he's talking about. First thing he says here, supplement your faith with virtue. Now what is virtue? And I was thinking about that. I looked up the Greek word. And, it, and here's, so I, I love this definition. It says character in a moral sense that gives a man his worth, and his efficiency. You say, what, what's that mean? I'm going to read it again. It's character in a moral sense that gives a man his worth and his efficiency. The NAS, NASB, by the way, talks about moral, instead of saying virtue, it says moral excellence. And what it's, what it's really saying is this, we look at that definition. There is an energy and a strength that belongs to the man, and, and that, that term man is generic. There is an energy or strength that belongs to a teenager, a child, an adult, and a parent, a grandparent. There is, there is an energy that comes when you are a person of virtue. There is a, there is a sense of worth and confidence that emanates from that. And I thank God that I grew up in a home where there was a tremendous energy that my dad and my mother and my grandparents had in this area of virtue. You contrast that what is, what, what, with what is going on in our homes today. You contrast that with what many children are growing up in. And if you're sitting there and that really kind of troubles you and kind of burdens you, and maybe you feel convicted, I, I'm, I'm, this is not a beat-up sermon, but this is a step-up sermon. Any and every one of us can draw a line in the sand and begin to live a life that has worth and efficiency. I love the thing efficiency because it's what it says to me, says, man, it, if, if I am living in relationship with Christ and I allow his values to, and biblical values to be a part of my life, I just, have an, I just have something that gets me through, even the most difficult of experiences. But it builds on it, and that's what it says, supplement your faith. You supplement your faith with virtue, and in order to strengthen your virtue, it says you supplement your virtue with knowledge. And I looked at the Greek word for that, and it said it really means a present intuitive knowledge and, in, and instinctively having insight. What good would that be for us? A present intuitive knowledge instinctively having insight. You and I need that. We can't, you know, uh, people, you know cell phones, you can do it a lot more, but oh, I should call a pastor and ask what I should do. You don't need to call me. Call him. Lean into him. 
But the only way you can lean in him is understand who he is. And the psalmist wrote something really cool in Psalm 119 in uh, verses uh, 97 to 99. He says, oh, how I love your instructions. He's talking to the Lord. I think about them all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies. Now, that, that is a good thing. If you're smarter than your enemy, who's Satan and all of his demons, and sometimes people will become a part of that, that thinking because they don't understand God, for they are my constant guide. In other words, there's the things you tell me, they guide me. Yes, I have more insight than my teachers, for I'm always thinking of your laws. That, it, that last verse would be a good verse to be a mantra if you're in university these days, and often, sadly, in our, in our schoolrooms. Because there are a lot of people who are good people. I'm not saying they're evil people, but there are a lot of people who have thought that they've outthought God and they've marginalized him and put him to the side. And it's amazing to me how many strong Christians enter the university atmosphere and become so messed up in their thinking. And it doesn't make them more efficient. It doesn't make them more confident. It makes them totally uncertain because they don't let God's word make them wiser than their teachers. There's a very interesting passage in Isaiah 5, 20 and 21. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Hold it right there. I am terrified. I truly am. I am terrified for what our children are being exposed to as truth. And there were things that for years were evil and we identified it. Now it's truth. And it's good. And some of the moral stands that we used to take as good, they now say are evil. It's not true. But it's tragically so in our society. And here's one of the challenges you're going to face. You're going to have to decide. You're going to have to have enough knowledge of God to stand for what is true. The second part of that, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. I've held this up many times and said this is truth. And people have said amen. But I could hold this up in many venues right now and people would boo. But it's still true. And it's still efficiency. And it still strengthens you. And it still builds in you the character that you long to have. We live in a very confused world. There are, there are mainstream evangelical leaders who are stepping away from the truth. They're actually denying their faith. Found out this week that one of the writers for Hillsong, right? I mean, I'm not talking about the whole thing, but I'm talking one of the writers for Hillsong has, has recanted his faith. Tragic. Tragic. But it hasn't changed the thing. The good news is this. You can know truth. And the Bible says if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And I was looking, I was reading through this, and I realized that is, this is literally what, what he's talking about when it says vigilance. Vigilance is being prepared. Add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, and knowledge with self-control. Oh, and I looked at that. I was thinking about self-control. And the word that came to me, and I think of self-control, is, is core strength. Now, I go to the gym a lot. I know it's hard to believe, but trust me, I do. And they talk to me all the time about core strength. I'm not quite got that under control yet. But I'm trying. Core strength. But core strength means strength in the middle. If you strength in the middle, it helps your back. It helps your legs. It helps you when you're everything about it, core strength is critical. Self-control is core strength. The passion says it this way, to, un, to add to your understanding, add the strength of self-control. The antithesis of self-control is uncontrolled passion. And James wrote about it in chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? 
that your passions are at war within you. You desire and you don't have, so you murder, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And hold that right there. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Totally understand that verse. The world is not our enemy. The values of the world is our enemy. The world's our friend. We're to love the world. And if the only friends you have are Christian friends, shame on you. What's wrong with you? You ought to have all kinds of friends. I have, I have many, many friends who don't even believe what I believe. They kind of like me and kind of feel bad that I'm so silly. But I'm praying that someday when they face the crises of life that are overwhelming to them, that happen when we do not have a core strength in Jesus Christ, that I'll have the opportunity to speak back into their lives. The truths of God's word. It says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? What God is saying there is this. Our spiritual lives, our values have to line up with his word. Personal vigilance is not built on good instincts. It's built on supplementing or growing our faith so we know how to walk with him. My daughter and my sons. My sons are grown. One's 35, one's 29. Irene's down in Portland celebrating my grandson. Uh, that's the son of my son, Zach, his first birthday today. She isn't thinking about you guys at all. She's partying. <laughs> but my son, who is still searching in his spiritual journey, is banking on my core strength is banking that what I have modeled or tried to model for him and my 35-year-old preacher son in Halifax and my 17-year-old daughter Tay, they're banking on self-control. They're banking that I will be a faithful father and a faithful husband. I have a wonderful wife who will have been so lucky to be married to me for 22 years next month. Don't quote me on that. Uh, well, this week's been a good, you can quote me this week, maybe not next week. No. I bank on Irene's self-control. I bank on her core strength. And our homes are desperate for moms and dads who have core strength. Our society is desperate for women, men and women of principle and godly character who cannot be bought. It's kind of interesting. Yesterday, and I got permission from the family to say this this morning. Yesterday I was, at, I was with Bob Ratcliffe and his family and we were at the House of Comfort and uh, Carolyn was laying there and she was gone. She was with Jesus. And I listened to the family talk about Carolyn. You know they didn't talk about how much money she made? They didn't talk about any of that stuff. But you know what they talked about? Her core strength. Her character. That was priceless. And she had some family members there who needed to be reminded of that. And her influence... In that room, it's powerful. Something else, by the way, and I'm not trying to read anything into this. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But when I walked in, the first thing I noticed is that Carolyn was gone. She had a smile on her face. And I don't know. I wasn't there when she passed. I know she took a big sigh and she passed. I've wondered if an angel just showed up and said, Carolyn, it's time to go. Because she was ready. And I thought, what a gift, what a gift to that family 
to be able to sit there and celebrate her love for Jesus. Core strength. Then it says steadfastness. Knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfast. Steadfastness is really what it is, is patience. Sometimes it's tough. I know that. Carolyn had, had a real wrestle with patience the last couple of weeks because the pain got very intense and she wanted to go home. I remember saying to her on Wednesday, Carolyn, when it's time, God will take you. I did not dream it would be in two days. But some of you are going through circumstances and say, but I know what's right. I know what I ought to do, but I can't. I just don't think I can last. Yes, you can, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And there's a passage in, in Revelation chapter 3, uh, verses 8 through 10. I know your works. Behold, and this is what Jesus is speaking to a faithful church. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. In other words, God always has a way for you. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And then verse 10. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Every one of us is going to go through circumstances in our life that are beyond our sight, ourselves. And it's that relationship with Christ that will hold us to. Christianity is like a race, but it's not a sprint. It's an endurance race. It's a marathon. And God calls us to it. It goes on. It talks about the other ones. We don't have time this morning to cover it all. But I, those core ones, are those are the ones I really wanted to talk about. But it just builds. When you have patience or steadfastness, then you add to that godliness. And what happens as you walk with God, you become more like him. The godliness, brotherly affection. If you really know Jesus, you're going to love the brothers. And finally, into brotherly affection, love, which is an immense love for a lost world. You love people. You don't have time for hatred. Because you're deeply in love with those around you. And the final thought that I want to share with you, let's just look at verses 8 through 10. I'm going to land this plane. Personal vigilance promotes community obedience. When you and I live out our life, there are those that fall in step. For if these qualities are yours, or they're mine, and are increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if you know to do good and you don't do it, you're going to pay for it. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind. Having forgot that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. I'm banking on God's word. I'm banking on the fact that if I will live out God's word according to what the teaching is here, that in the circumstances of life, I will discover the ability to stand. Actually, 2 Peter chapter 2 goes on and it talks. I'm going to read just a couple of verses of it. It's, it talks about what happens, and it's a day we're living in, where many people, even people that have been in the Word, they turn and they change the gospel. and said, they're waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. For then the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boast of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, for they themselves, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he's enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord, Je Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they're again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. I close with these thoughts. And worship team, if you'd come. Imagine a world. Imagine what would happen in the community of Presque Isle, in the community of Caribou, and Mars Hill, and Easton, in Washburn, and wherever you might come from this morning, imagine if every home there were kids who were confident that their mom and their dad were going to stick it out. They were going to be there for them, and they could count on the fact that they were going to be faithful to one another. 
You owe that to your wife. You owe that to your husband. A world where integrity has no price tag. I grew up in a home. It was, it's so rock solid. I grew up in a home where integrity, my, my mom and my dad, absolutely integrity could not be bought. I had grandparents who just lived out, and I watched them live it out, and I watched them make decisions that cost them in the short term, but they were just glad to give it up. A world where morals have biblical guidelines. And our children experience the joy of sexual purity. We raise our kids up to realize that the world's concept is bad. Where the church lives out biblical truth and is unashamedly founded in Jesus. And lost and broken people come to the church because hope is modeled there. Where God is our hope for purity and peace. And where the only, instead of a society where it's almost like people are starting to try to make God more palatable, saying if you come to God, you'll get wealthy. I got news for you. If you come to God, you may not get wealthy in this world's goods, but you'll be wealthy in eternal goods. And that's the only thing that counts. That's the only thing that lasts. Imagine a workplace where there are believers that stand out, not because of what they say, but because of who they are. That's the world that God has called us to. A world where you and I as Christians are vigilant. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing a song in closing. And if the Holy Spirit speaks into your heart, and you, you know, absolutely, you know, you, you have a strong marriage, you love God, but you just feel like, man, I need to go and drive an anchor deeper. Or maybe you're struggling and, 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 and you're feeling crushed and you've got all kinds of pressures to cave to the world and you really just want to pray and maybe have someone pray with you the altars will be open we're going to sing a song and our service will be over I love you thank you for being here thank you for taking this Sunday morning and coming and focusing on the truth because if you know this truth you're on the road to freedom